I guess I kind of uh, misspoke when I said stop coding. Uh, so I, I divide my day up into two hour blocks. Uh, I, have to have a, I have to have a pretty rigid schedule, it's the only way I get things done. And so uh, I divide my day up into about two hour blocks normally. And so during, uh, and I split up the things I have to do, whether it's you know uh, business related stuff, or whether it's actual coding, or whatever it may be, uh, I decide what, you know, class of things I'm going to be doing, whether it requires hardcore focus or just requires that I'm churning out and checking off tasks. And I kind of I stagger them throughout the day. So I usually have, I had at least four, usually five of these two hour blocks. And during the focus blocks, which is usually the coding blocks, I don't, I don't do the 30 minute warning. I, uh, I just have the two hour, all right, it's time to stop and do something else warning. Uh, and I find that two hours is enough to, you know, where I've gotten into the zone and I get a good amount of work done. And there are days when I just power, where I can power through and I'll line up, you know, two or three of those coding blocks all back to back. I still will get up and take breaks, you know, every hour or two. Uh, but I, uh, but yeah, I have two distinct types of working. So the other, the other kind of working, and this is, a, this is just more of a personal thing that I use. Uh, when I'm doing the other type of working, the, you know, turning out tasks, making phone calls, sending emails, you know, talking to the accountant, whatever it may be. Um, I, uh, I, I schedule those things specifically to get those things done, and I, it's, I have to resist the urge to go back to the coding or go back to the, you know, working on whatever product or, or you know, client uh, project I'm working on. And so I have another alarm that's part of that 30 minute, one of the reasons I have a 30 minute alarm isn't just to tell me to get up. Uh, I actually, usually what the alarm says, uh, and I change it every once in a while, but right now what it says is, uh, you're not coding, right? And it reminds me that I shouldn't be coding. So every every thirty minutes during my non-focus uh, uh, two-hour block, I get a, I get a, uh, a, a pop-up alert both on my phone and on my laptop that says, "Hey, you're not coding, right?" To remind me that that's for later. And so I, I need that focus because really I don't like doing a lot of that stuff, and it's really really easy to uh, you know it's easy and fun to do the things you like and you're good at, right? And it, and uh, those things need to get done too. All this stuff needs to get done. And so it's very, very easy to justify to yourself working on the code because it has to get done. Uh, so uh, preventing yourself from talking yourself into doing it when you shouldn't be is, uh, is a constant struggle for me, uh, as I know it probably is for a lot of you. So, yeah, let's get it. You talked about sort of starting out and wanting to build games and, and moving into building consulting business. What would you have any advice on? I wish I did because I want to. I want to do that too. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't myself. <clears throat> uh, there are other people in the community who are either starting to do that or have done it to a little to more to more of a uh, you know are further on in the process than I am. I know you know like Black Pixel for example are starting to do that a lot more, uh, and there are a lot of others. You know, some of the other kind of uh, agency are you know wanting to. Everyone wants to do that, right? Everyone wants to build products. Uh, personally, I haven't found a good way to do it yet. Um, you know, I, I think you know when it comes when it comes time for me to really start making that transition again because I'm not there yet. Uh, you know, I, I think probably the most difficult thing is is the investment that it's going to take. Right? You you have to you have, you have to devote resources to it. Right? And so uh, figuring out how to uh, you know when you budget for building a product, for example, you know, don't just budget what you think it's going to cost cash-wise, budget people and, uh, you know, the opportunity cost of taking someone, you know, who works for you off of a client project and putting them on, and, you know, some kind of product or some kind of internal project, you know, it's not just uh, their, you know, what you're paying them uh, and their salary, but it's also what you lose from not being able to put them on client projects. So you need to figure out, you know, you need to make sure you have enough cash flow to handle that. And then, I think, you know, I don't know, because I haven't done it, but if I had to guess, I would say it's just a matter of, you know, keeping the focus, just like it is with all this stuff, this, yes, is uh, keep the focus on doing that. I, I, would, I would assume, uh, just talking to other people, that, uh, that, you know, kind of having people dedicated to that, having a separate kind of internal division to deal with product side and another one to deal with the consulting side, you know, I don't know if that's the only way to do it, but to me, that kind of feels like the way you would do it. You should do it because you want to make sure that the people that are focusing, that the people are focusing on one specific thing, because the goals are very different in those two companies, those types of companies, right? Selling a product is very different from selling services, uh, and so you want to make sure 
then the people that are focusing on building products are focusing on you know, the things that are important to building a product, while the people that are doing providing services are focusing on the things that are important to providing services. So, you know, I don't know. That's the way I would approach it. Uh, you know, and I would seek out some of the other developers here at DubDub who are, are who already done those kinds of things. But I think it wasn't even I think uh, you know even the, the, what didn't Omni do consulting before as well? They should do the products. I mean, even Ken Case might have some stuff about that. I don't know. Uh, I think a lot of us have done that. Uh, I haven't done it yet. I've been I con I'm constantly thinking about how to do it. So I have some thoughts on how I might do it, but I have no idea if I'm even in the ballpark. Ship as, ship as much as you can, as often as you can. You know, don't ship crap, right? But also don't uh, don't paralyze yourself and never ship because it's not perfect. It's never going to be perfect. So ship as quickly as possible. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I do. I think that was I think that was uh, Owen Goss's survey. I believe he did a survey of developers. Yeah. So uh, so yeah. You know. Then and also there's uh, I, I actually have uh, I've I've analyzed very deeply what it took for Rovio to be so successful. And I think I've figured out their, in, uh, their, entire, their entire strategy. And that's, you know, it's only, and it's only really two steps, maybe three. Step one, you know, is build 71 games. And step two is make your 72nd game angry birds. And, <laughs> you know, that's all you really need to do. But, you know, the kind of the lesson there is, you know, Rovio wasn't, for example, uh, and this isn't, the, this isn't the only overnight success is this way. I haven't yet to see an overnight success that, uh, that did it with their first, their first app. You know, anyone's considered an overnight success. I mean, look at, you know, Keith and Natalia with Avanji, right? This, uh, uh, Temple Run was the game. You know, Temple Run was their, I don't know, sixth game, I think, in the App Store. You know, they were doing, they were doing pretty well, and they were doing really well. Uh, you know, in the case of Rovio, you know, they, they did a ton of games, like Brew, J2ME stuff, you know, in mobile before, you know, anyone cared about mobile. Uh, you know, and they, they had a ton of experience shipping games and building quality games, or at least trying to build quality games. Because everything you build, especially early on, this is definitely true of game development and true of app development as well. You know, version one of your very first app is going to suck really bad. Right? There's not much you can do about it. It's not, you know, it's, it might not be the worst thing in the world, but it's probably going to be, the, it'll be the worst thing you ever build. Everything you build, uh, is going to be worse than the thing you build next. So build the next thing, and you'll you know you're going to have something hopefully better than the thing you built before. So going back to the very first you know uh, piece of software I worked on, you know the stuff I did, I can't imagine the crap that I did. I can't see that code because that was you know for someone else, but uh, I can't imagine what it looked like. So yeah, shipping, 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 do it. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. Well, I'll be hanging out here, and I'll be here till Thursday. And uh, so, you know, send me a uh, you know a mention on Twitter or something if you want to hang out or whatever. Uh, I'm at Ner Ner, like I said on the slide there. And thanks.